So this will be the <clears throat> the last lecture for today. We'll talk about the Heian period and the Kamakura period. We're actually covering quite a bit in this one, but hopefully I can do it in a reasonable amount of time. So the Heian period, about the 8th century until the 12th century. Uh, the name for the period comes from Heian Kyo, which means capital of peace and tranquility. In previous times, uh, before the Nara period, the emperors had moved the capitals every time there was a new emperor. They stopped that during the Nara period. So oftentimes we'll have the city where the emperor has their capital um, being the name of the period. So this is modern Kyoto. And the idea with this is to escape the power of Buddhist monks in Nara. So like we saw at the end of the Tang Dynasty, there was this idea that Buddhism, which originally um, people were hoping to unite Japan under one authority, actually created a bureaucracy that was hard to control. So this is the Fujiwara clan, uh, who were the daimyos that were running um, Japan at this time. Remember, um, during most periods in Japan, even though there is an emperor who's technically um, an autocratic ruler in practice, it never really works out that way. But it's relatively centralized in the Fujiwara clan's power at this time. And uh, the Fujiwara clan decided that it was important to develop independent of China. Uh, so in 838, they closed borders to the outside uh, and began to develop their own ideas, uh, like we see here with Red Fudo. So this image is an esoteric Buddhist image, like in Tibet, which we'll talk about a little bit later on in the class. And uh, in esoteric Buddhism, there's universal Buddha over a pantheon of deities. So this can be quite complex for a regular person to follow, but it's great if you're an artist because then you have all these incredible, uh, visually interesting deities that you can portray in your artworks. So the Fudo, who is our red dude pictured here, and we'll kind of see the origin of this when we look at Hindu art a little bit later on, this particular style, uh, but it is done in, in a Japanese way. Fudo means immovable. Um, so that has a relationship to Buddhism. So a Buddhist, as they go through life, uh, they want to be able to, especially if it's a monk or someone, wants to be able to reach enlightenment. And to do that, uh, you have to um, release yourself from attachment. And remember when they're talking about attachment, they're talking about attachment to things uh, and to wealth, but also even to your own family, uh, your spouse, um, your children. And that doesn't mean, again, that they don't love their children and such, but the idea is that anything could, um, this attachment uh, will prevent you from becoming enlightened. So how does that relate to immovable? The idea is that um, while you're reaching enlightenment, there will be a lot of barriers that could be thrown in your way. And Red Fudo can help you to be immovable on your quest to become enlightened. So we see in it, he has a dragon sword, uh, which is um, representative of lightning. Uh, it's a Vajra, uh, and if that sounds like a Hindu word, that's because it is. Uh, and we'll look at the, the origin of these types of images a little bit later on. He's holding a lariat, uh, and the lariat is right here. And that's kind of like a lasso that will capture the difficulties that you might face on your road to enlightenment. And um, it's a way, again, Red Fudo, he's making you immovable uh, towards getting, becoming enlightened, but um, he's preventing you from attachment. So it seems contradictory, uh, but again, enlightenment is kind of the idea with this. When you get in close, uh, you can see that he is normally portrayed um, in this kind of like ogre way uh, with lots of jewelry, like a bodhisattva we'd see in the Tang Dynasty in China. Uh, and he has two fangs, one that goes upwards and one that goes downwards. A close up of the hands, you can see this is a very um, kind of Tang Dynasty type of um, way of creating uh, lines like we saw earlier. When you get to the um, to the acolytes of the uh, Red Fudo, uh, and these would exist in real life, you can see more of a Japanese style with this kind of like round face. Uh, so the idea is that the acolytes, they become like very youthful and healthy. 
Uh, so they have like kind of round faces and fleshy bodies. Uh, and they even, by following Red Fudo, take on um, his fangs. And you can see that portrayed here. So, but this general form of imagery, we'll see how it develops a little bit later on in Hindu art uh, and how it influenced art um, all the way through the world. So Pure Land Buddhism, uh, which becomes popular during this time period, is the most popular form of Buddhism um, for regular people uh, today in Japan. So that's known as Jodo, Jodo in Japanese. And we kind of talked about this form of Buddhism before. Uh, the Amida, who's the infinite light, uh, we saw that in, in Guan Yin's crown. Uh, we were looking at Tang Dynasty art and the Western Paradise. Um, so the idea is, is that a person who is following this type of Buddhism can say, Hail to the Amida Buddha. And if you just do that, you can reach salvation. Uh, so it's a very like democratic and um, easily accessible form of Buddhism. Uh, and again, it's most popular in Japan today. This form of art kind of goes with that idea that we're trying to bring everybody in. It's a universal religion. Uh, and we call this type of style the Rai Go, which means a welcoming approach. Uh, so the idea is that this Buddha is someone you want to be with who's uh, bringing you in uh, and helping you reach salvation. It's a multi-part hollow wooden figure, which is why it still exists. If it was solid wood, not only would it be tremendously heavy, but it also would have cracked and, and fallen apart by now. And it is part of a larger installation of the Western Paradise, which kind of like the um, Taoist Paradise that we were looking at before. It's where you can hope to go um, when you reach salvation. So when getting closer, <laughs> I'll ask you, what do you think about the mood that this Raigo Buddha is creating? So pause it. Get your own thoughts. Okay, now that you've gotten your own thoughts, um, in previous classes, the first thing that people usually think when they see this Buddha is say, he looks like he's high. Um, maybe that's so with the heavy lids and such. Um, but uh, a very relaxed kind of figure, looking down, um, but not necessarily. Sometimes people read it as snobby or above you. Other people just read it as relaxed. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting that this is called the walk, welcoming approach style because uh, when this class was originally offered, uh, they, use, they have at CCS, they have all these like video screens around campus and they would have advertisements for particular classes. And the advertisement for this class, DH201, they had this close up that we're looking at right here. Uh, so hoping to bring you into the class, which you have to take anyway, but bring you into the uh, uh, this particular version of the class. So this one is a multi-part hollow wooden figure. Um, by making things out of uh, wood panels instead of solid wood, uh, it can stretch and um, expand uh, without cracking up the whole piece. Uh, so this was meant to last. Uh, you can also notice that it was gilded at one time. A lot of the paint is, is worn off otherwise, but we still see some of the gilding. Um, this style of uh, Buddha with a very round face, um, you know, in the kind of neck rolls and um, the snail shell hair. Uh, we'll see how this develops a little bit later on when we see the development of Buddhist art uh, when we talk about India. So in um, Japan, uh, remember I talked about this, this idea that Chinese culture was um, somewhat superior. Um, so in Japan, even at this time after they had cut off uh, the borders, there was scholarly writing in Chinese. And only men were um, trained in writing in Chinese language. But poetry was in Japanese, and women would be trained, mostly elite women, would be trained to write in Japanese. Uh, so that kind of worked out, despite the patriarchy trying to limit women, uh, the art that we're looking at this class, because it was moving artistic styles forward, uh, it comes from the Japanese language um, calligraphy that women are using. So hiragana would be the literary skip, script, uh, aka onade. Onade means the feminine hand. Uh, so this particular piece, we can see a very expressive uh, type of calligraphy 
on a fancy type of decorated paper. Um, and again, it wasn't necessarily to get something that's readable. Uh, it's more to get something that's expressive, like we saw in um, China uh, in the Song Dynasty. So very expressive indeed. You can see how we have these extensions of lines and uh, very quickly but gracefully done. So again, since women uh, could write in Japanese, uh, they were the um, responsible for most of the genres and forms moving forward. Uh, so one of them is this type of story, uh, which is um, generally thought to be the world's first novel. So kind of think to yourself, what is the difference between a novel and other types of stories? And so maybe take, take a pause and think about it. Okay, so I'll tell you what previous classes had said and also what I think. Uh, the difference between some of the unique things that a novel has is that a novel is a fictional story. Uh, so it's not about some kind of culture hero like a mythology. Um, and it's not like, a, like Plato's um, dialogues or something where you have fictional creators' uh, stories to tell, to teach a lesson. Instead, um, what a novel does is it follows characters it gets inside of their heads. It follows their life and the ups and downs. Um, there is like conflict and story elements that you would see in previous types of stories. Uh, but this kind of like inner life and a fictional story about people that are not necessarily important, um, that's how the novel form differ differs from other types of stories. It exists on its own, almost an art for art's sake in some ways. Um, so during the time of... The, the Heian Dynasty, the Fujiwara clan, the elites, um, since they, um, if you weren't part of the clan or if you were part of the clan, uh, it was kind of centralized power. So a lot of elites didn't have much to do, not administration like they would in previous times. Uh, so they kind of developed these leisurely aesthetics. And leisurely is one way to put it. Uh, It's leisurely in that they have all their needs taken care of. They're living in this wonderful mansion. Uh, they have beautiful clothes. They have servants and such. But it's not exactly leisurely <laughs> because elites during this time were expected to follow, and again, a lot of these rules were unspoken, but everyone was expected to follow, very specific um, behaviors and roles. And they were supposed to... Um, you don't say things that you're feeling and you're not necessarily, you try not to show emotional things on your face. Um, so this is written by Murasaki um, and uh, women would learn, again, Japanese writing. Uh, it's shown in Shinden, which is a country home, basically a mansion for, for people. Uh, Yamato A would be male, hand, and then Ana A uh, would be women's pictures. Uh, so this would be like a text in an illustration, and people would read the story, um, and they would follow the illustration. So I'll just like give you a rundown of the story from O'Reilly. So Lady Murasaki's story follows the actions and inner psychological life of Genji, the signing prince. He tries to retain the support of those in power while indulging in numerous affairs. As the story reflects on the fleeting nature of life's pleasures, remember that from the beginning, it is tinged with sadness. Much of the story takes place in a shaded, cloistered atmosphere of a Shinden, a high-end period country home with central hall, some smaller buildings, a network of colored walkways connecting them with ponds, bridges, and gardens. Uh, so some of the innovative things that were done in this picture, again, you can't show the emotion on faces. You can see how all the faces are pretty much blank. But this is actually a very emotional scene. Um, so the color was done by um, a different artist, and the colors are to symbolize moods. So what had happened in this scene, and I'm going to include a link to a very good translation of the Tale of Genji if you want to read it. Uh, it's really readable, uh, and it doesn't sound like archaic or anything. If you like novels, I think you'll appreciate it. Um, but what happened during this story is, um, and the way it's, it's written in the story, uh, it's written as kind of like an encounter, uh, I think that most of you, when you read it uh, with modern eyes, that you'll see it as what I think it is, is a sexual assault. Uh, so the main character, uh, who's right here, um, she had encountered um, a man that works in the palace. 
He was an older man and um, he tried to make moves on her and tried to corner her uh, and touch her in places she didn't want to be touched. Um, and then he finally, you know, left. She was able to get rid of him. And then afterwards, she was emotionally distraught. Um, and she went back to her servants uh, to get cleaned up. Uh, and you can see that she's getting her hair comb right here. Uh, she has another person reading to her. In this, she is very distraught. Um, she had just been assaulted, uh, and there was nothing she could do about it because the person who had done it um, had power. Uh, so kind of think of the Me Too movement. Uh, nowadays, it was to get out of that uh, men who have power and getting away with sexual assaults. Um, but in this period in Japan, she couldn't do anything about it. So the colors are supposed to represent the types of emotion, emotional turmoil that she's going through in this scene that the blank faces don't let us know. So this is the link, but I'll include the link uh, in the comment section of this video. So the Kamakura period is quite different. Uh, so in 1180 to 85, the Genpai Civil War, uh, Yoritomo, uh, the Seitai Shogun, barbarian quelling generals, in other words, getting rid of the, they called the previous uh, ruling classes, barbarians. Um, and this was located in the Kamakura clan, uh, who was south of Edo, that would become an important city when we talk about it later on. And because it, this was a um, period that was built through warfare, uh, they dump court behavior in favor of these heroic stories. So you can see this one is the night attack on the Sanjo Palace. Uh, and it's a hand scroll, so you would roll it out. Uh, usually when you see these displayed in museums, they're all rolled out the whole story, but it would be one at a time if you were actually experiencing it uh, the way it was originally made. And you can see the palace is on fire. So this shows an attack. Um, the person who was the member of the palace, uh, he you know, asked his samurai to defend him. Uh, it became clear that he was not going to, um, that his samurai weren't, be, or weren't, weren't going to be able to defend his palace. Um, so the invaders asked him to surrender. And uh, we'll kind of talk about this later on, but surrender was not an option. Uh, so he refused to surrender. So they set the palace on fire to hope to get him out. Uh, but instead, the occupant of the house, the owner of the house, uh, burns inside of it. So we can see uh, a couple of interesting things going on here. Firstly, um, we had seen previously the, the view um, in the high-end period that's being used. That's a very interesting view. Uh, it's sometimes called the three-quarters view in modern times. Uh, and the idea is that you have a certain type of um, perspective where the things that are at the top are farther away, and the things that are at the bottom are closer. Um, and then you kind of have these diagonal lines that all go off uh, in one direction. So different than what you would see single point perspective, for instance, in um, Western art, where everything leads towards a disappearing point. Instead, you have things just kind of leading off uh, parallel orthogonals leading off in the same direction. But when we're looking in interior spaces, it's almost as if the roof has been taken off and we're seeing things from above, we can kind of get inside the building. So we see the same thing in the Kamakura period here. There's parts inside the building and outside the building. We still have these orthogonals, this three quarters view. Uh, things are farther away at the top, things that are closer at the bottom. And this is kind of a view where we can see the inside and the outside. It's kind of like a, a view from above. You can compare, if you want, you can compare what's going on in China at this time with Ma Yuan. And remember the conversation we had, people had a lot of different ideas about peacefulness or just vagueness of the space in Ma Yuan's uh, painting. Quite different than the type of action and violence that we have going on in the Kamakura period. Uh, some interesting things that are going on is the way that fire is produced. And we saw a little bit of that with the Red Fudo. But how do you produce fire in a two-dimensional work, especially if you're doing mostly linear work like this one? Uh, and I think the conventions that developed work very well. It doesn't look like fire, per se. Uh, but when you add the black smoke um, and the curves, you get the impression of this dynamic, roiling blaze that's going through the building. 
Uh, so a very interesting technique that continued throughout uh, Japanese work. So this type of view uh, became used um, when um, in role-playing games. Uh, so I'm just including, I haven't played you know, video games since PlayStation 1, so I'm including one I had, Persona 2, uh, and it's the same type of view. Uh, this is an interior space here, uh, but it's like the roof has been taken off when you look in, and we have all the orthogonals going in the same direction. You can kind of um, go through this space three-dimensionally. Um, and um, again, the things that are farthest away are at the top, and the things that are closer are at the bottom. And this is a very intuitive, even though it's not like Western perspective, it's very intuitive. Like nobody had to teach me how to do this when I was younger. Uh, I understood immediately how to navigate through these spaces. Uh, so a very interesting type of perspective and shows that perspective isn't um, necessarily just math. Uh, it's also cultural, but it can be done in different ways and still understood by people. So this portrait of Ushugi uh, Shigefusa, um, and it shows him in meditation, um, but he is a daimyo. Um, and the daimyo, especially during this period, and um, the periods we're going to study from now on, there's a lot of fighting be behind for control uh, amongst the daimyo. So militarism is the highest value. So you're probably thinking, well, then why is he being shown as this Shinto priest in meditation? Uh, so it's kind of showing both sides of the military leader. So daimyo are the warrior nobles. Uh, they're basically um, land wealth um, generals. And they would have their bushi, who are the samurai swordsmen. This type of piece, which is a segi, it's done in multi-piece, uh, would be for a family shrine. And generally how these were done, like first off, we can tell this is an elite guy. Uh, you know how they say, you wear the big pants, you're in charge. It's kind of literally true in the case of this period in Japan. Uh, and then sometimes you see it in later periods to when people want to look traditional. The hat he's wearing is like a priest hat. Um, but generally this form, so they, uh, the artist would have the form for a daimyo uh, or other elite person. And they'd be able to produce those one after the other and they'd all be the same. But then the face, and we'll get in a little closer to see it, uh, you can see how there's a seam right here. The face would be carved specially for the likeness of the particular figure that you're making it for. So Shigafusa in this one. Um, and the way of thinking about how people live, and this is, I'm sure regular people didn't think this way, uh, but elites and samurai would think this way, is that again, life is precious. Uh, and because it's precious, you have to live it to the fullest. And that even means taking risks that could lead to death. Uh, so if you don't live life, like you could die at any moment, it's like you're not living at all. So to give you an example, if a man were never to fade away like the dews of Arishino, never to vanish like the smoke over Tori Bayama, but linger forever in the world, how things would lose their power to move this, move us. The most precious thing in life is uncertainty. Uh, so this uncertain um, way of thinking of the world. And again, think of a place where they have typhoons, uh, constant warfare during this period, um, and earthquakes. Uh, you have to be ready to die at any time. But also this view, although it's useful for earthquakes and typhoons, think of it also that it's useful for people who are militaristic leaders who want to have people who are serving them willing to die at any time. Basically, you could be cannon fodder if you want to be. Uh, so there's definitely a elite self-serving nature to some of these ideas. So this one is something you can kind of just do on your own so you can get an idea of what different types of ancient sculptures, um, you can compare them. The one on the left, uh, you can see the sculpture of the priest. The one on the right um, is also a um, kind of a scholar type, um, a scribe from ancient Egypt. So if you want to, you can do this on an extra credit board or just in your own notes. And compare and contrast how these figures are portrayed and try to think about things like how do they exist in time? Is there any idealization or lack of? Um, is one more naturalistic than the other? Think about things like that. And again, if you want, you can put it in the extra credit board. 